the aeroplane was designed for somebody as foolhardy as me who took things pretty lightly and, and, and it flew itself. And, I mean, you could make mistakes in a DAC which another aeroplane would kill you for. This is the story of the most famous aeroplane of them all, the Douglas Commercial Three, the aircraft they called the Dakota. It was the Dakota which saved Flight Lieutenant Jimmy Edwards' life when he was shot down over Arnhem. It was the Dakota which took troops to D-Day, dropped supplies in Burma, and helped retake the Pacific. Of course, it wasn't designed for war. It was a passenger plane. Last time somebody bothered to check, it had carried 97 million people. But then it's been around for 50 years. Now nostalgia figures in this story, fond memories, affectionate anecdotes amongst those who flew them and flew in them. Those who remember a more exciting age of flying when just starting the engines was an adventure all its own. Stansted, London's third airport, Air Atlantique, a tiny British airline, flies DAX because no other aircraft will do. It's the flying equivalent of the tramp steamer, and like the tramp steamer, it hasn't been replaced. You may think of this as a wartime aircraft, disgorging GIs when Miller was playing Moonlight Serenade. But the DAC first flew in 1935, and was setting new standards of comfort long before the war. Mind you, they built 10,000 before the end of 1945, and that alone has made sure the DAC is still going strong. Now it's in the hands of young pilots for whom jets hold no attraction. Theirs is a love affair with a grand old lady, for leaving the ground in a DAC is a unique experience. To Americans who'd spent years flying around in leaking tri-motors held together by fabric and string, the Douglas Commercial, first the one, then the two, and later the most famous version, the DC-3, was style indeed. You could actually hold a conversation with the person next door. There was air conditioning, a pretty stewardess, silver service, a loo, and on the flight deck, an autopilot, the first passenger plane to have one. It didn't leak, it didn't take much maintaining, and above all, it made money for the airlines. It was the first aircraft to make a profit just by carrying passengers. With the Dakota, air transport was changed forever. like this when they were flying around in airliners held together with string and sealing wax. A young American called Donald Douglas took on a challenge from transcontinental and western air to design a new plane. TWA's most famous director, Charles Lindbergh, insisted that it must be able to take off and fly on one engine. And that's what the Douglas Commercial One could do, just. Test pilot Carl Cover flew it first in July 1933. Later, he flew its big brother, the DC-2, 14 passengers at a stately 150 miles an hour. It was Bill Littlewood of American Airlines who pressed for a bigger DC-2. Douglas came up with the ubiquitous DC-3, and a legend was born. The Dakota was created on the drawing boards in California by a team to which aviation owes much, for their skill and foresight under the direction of Arthur Raymond. But the DC-3 was a combination of what everybody wanted. We didn't really realize how much it was that. At the time, we hadn't any idea how wide the market was going to be. Of course, the big, th big thing was the war that came along, brought those thousands of airplanes we built, but they met 
It was adaptable, adjustable to practically anybody's need. Fifty years on, Arthur Raymond lives high in the hills above Los Angeles, almost within sight of the airport at Santa Monica, from where his revolutionary aeroplane first flew in December 1935. Did you think then that uh, the aircraft you designed would go on for 50 years? No. Actually, we had to decide well, how to design the tooling. And we just thought we'd design it for 25 airplanes, but then now we're going to be optimistic we'll make it 50. <laughs> So we didn't think too far ahead. <laughs> to celebrate this 50th birthday, Dakotas gathered in Holland at an event organized by the Dutch Dakota Association. I have to say that the Dutch are quite mad about the DAC. In 1982, they formed the Dutch Dakota Association and a year later bought this 40-year-old DC-3. And since then, they've recruited 2,000 volunteers. KLM 747 captains queue up to fly the DDA Dakota. They're as keen on it as the thousands who turned out to the airfield at Eindhoven to wish the DAC happy birthday. The Americans were there too, appropriately, with a Dakota of the Confederate Air Force, that private flying force where you can be a colonel if you have enough money. After a gargantuan voyage from Texas, this DAC sent the Dutch into raptures. Everything about the, air, the airplane is special to me. My father was a captain with the airlines flying these when I was born, and, and this is what I learned to fly in. And uh, it's just a fantastic airplane. It'll do, it'll do things that it was never designed to do, and it'll get you through in times when other planes couldn't make it. Amongst the judges, Englishman Arthur Piercy, author of countless books on the Dakota, acknowledged as the man who knows most about the aircraft he first flew in in 1945 and has been crazy about ever since. Nostalgia has crept in with the DC-3 is that uh, some years ago there weren't many people and suddenly guys opened their foot lockers and found their old photograph of their old C-47 that they flew. They, be they became interested, wanted to know where it was and what had happened to it. And boy, you can still, it can still be around. We estimate there's still 1,200 still flying. South African Air Force have got 50 and so on. But we, yes, we think that it will go on and on and on. And I've always prophesied that uh, the only replacement for the DC-3 is another DC-3. But we just can't persuade Douglas to build them. Surely he can't be serious. Did they really try to persuade Douglas to start building the DAC again? Well, you won't believe this, but the Dutch Dakota Association are buying another DAC, which they're going to mothball in a hangar at Amsterdam and roll out when the aircraft is 75 on the 17th of December 2010. Why are the Dutch so keen on the Dakota? Well, possibly because they remember it dropping agents behind enemy lines in the war, and almost certainly because KLM was the first European airline to use it back in the 1930s. In 1936, KLM's first managing director, Dr. Albert Plesman, ordered 24 of them. The Europeans hadn't seen anything like it. Here was an all-metal monoplane with a retractable undercarriage. Remember that only a few years before, passengers had been travelling in tri-motors where air conditioning was provided by opening the window and you could lean out of the window to get a good look at any interesting passengers boarding after you. When the tri-motors went, the Dutch, never ones to be left behind in innovation, started talking about a daily service leaving for Sydney, Australia. Suddenly, aviation had leapt ahead. KLM had pioneered the Douglas commercial line in Europe. In 1934, they entered a DC-2 in the London to Melbourne air race. And although it came second, it captured the public's imagination more than the winner, which was an aeroplane built for racing. And the Dutch national airline, ever efficient, took along fair-paying passengers to prove that leaving England for Australia could become an everyday occurrence. But in between the dream and reality came war. Exactly 10 years after the McRobertson Trophy race of 1934, the Douglas commercial in military guise was overhead the invasion beaches of D-Day. On June the 6th, 1944, 108 Dakotas dropped the main section of the 3rd Parachute Brigade. Then, as the Allies fought their way south, the DAC used makeshift airstrips to resupply them. Without it, Operation Overlord would not have been possible. Think of the way we landed on strips in, in um, France. 
in Normandy on metal strips that are only a few, few well, I suppose 100 yards long, which bounce. And, and I never checked my load. They gave us a, a slide rule to work out where to put all the freight and what it all weighed. And I didn't. I just made sure it was tied down. The slide rule never came out of his plastic bag, as far as I was concerned. Off you went. You opened the throttles. And at the end of the runway, if it, if it wasn't allowable to get airborne, you pulled the wheels up. That got it airborne, all right. In September 1944, it was Dakotas which towed gliders to Arnhem and the ill-fated Operation Market Garden to capture the bridges over the Rhine. Jimmy Edwards says their briefing made it all sound so simple, but casualties were heavy. On his fourth trip, Flight Lieutenant Edwards was on his way home from Arnhem when his Dakota came face to face with a German fighter. And of course, it was on fire. Both engines and the whole of that cabin was full of flames and smoke. So I opened this bit here which it says here, emergency exit, turn, handle, throw open. I did that and the slipstream took it away immediately. And that, of course, drew all the flames and smoke this way. So the only thing I could do then was to stand on the seat, I put my head out into the slipstream so I could breathe and hang on to the stick, which is this thing here, with one hand and just hold it off and hold it off until it crashed. And then what happened was that the Mercifully, we hit this forest, but we didn't hit big trees by some quirk of fate. We hit small trees, which slowed us up without breaking us up. And eventually, it tipped over on its nose, and it went almost vertical, so that I was looking at the ground. And then, mercifully also, instead of going that way, it went that way. It fell back onto the ground, and the shock catapulted me through the roof. I went up, landed on the roof, and fell onto the ground and ran from alive. And then the whole thing blew up. For that, Jimmy Edwards won the Distinguished Flying Cross. And a member of the same squadron, Flight Lieutenant David Lord, here on the right, won the VC. He carried on with a dropping mission, even though one wing of his Dakota was on fire. Some of his crew bailed out before it crashed. Lord did not. David Lord was finally unlucky. But the stories of what the Dakota put up with are legion. At times, it seemed almost indestructible. It was tough, and it needed to be. There were no concentrated load points except where the landing gear landed and where you hooked on the engine. And uh, there was no single spar. We had three spars, and we had the skin taking some of the stress. And the result was the things tended to crumple. They, didn't <laughs> they really didn't do anything catastrophic, unless it was a pretty strong crash. I once landed at Hendon. I wasn't thinking. I bounced so often that the wing commander was almost hysterically sent for me and he just went what, 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 what. and I said I, I, I suppose I was thinking of something else. Said, Get the undercarriage checked dear boy. He said. <laughs> it was perfectly all right. The DAC was so reliable that it was favoured by wartime leaders as their personal transport. The Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in Europe, General Eisenhower, paid it the greatest compliment when he said that, along with the Jeep, the DAC was vital in winning the Second World War. Monty had one too. Actually, he had several of them, and in one he personally designed the interior. He liked to study the terrain as he flew over old battlegrounds. So, in the heat of the desert, his navigator prepared a series of maps to help him. By May 1945, the war in Europe was over, and by August, Japanese prisoners of war were being carried by Dax in the Far East, where she'd had such a distinguished war career. In June 1948, she had another job to do in Berlin. When the Russians blockaded the roads to the city, the British and the Americans mounted the biggest and most incredible airlift ever. They called it Operation Plainfair, and the Dakotas carried everything from clothes to coal. It was salvation for the people of Berlin, and salvation too for many struggling British airlines, the Lakers of this world, who suddenly found themselves with more work than they could cope with. Fortunes were made, more war surplus Dakotas were bought, many of the airlines we use today in Britain were born in the Berlin airlift. 
military and civil, the DAX flew into Berlin by day and by night, in all weathers, sometimes landing one every minute. Was it the DAX finest hour? Possibly. But it was also the end of the line. In the sheds at Long Beach, California, production was stopped. And 50 years on, these sheds are still being put to good use for the production now of the MD-80 twin jet, the great-granddaughter of the Dakota. McDonnell Douglas are well aware of how important to the development of their company the DC-3 was. We know that that aircraft is the one that got commercial aviation literally out of diapers and into the air. And uh, it was the first airplane that could make money just by hauling passengers. Here, at the headquarters of what they now call McDonnell Douglas, the huge hangar where they once built DC-10s is being used as the temporary home for a famous ancestor. One of the last DC-2s is being restored to flying condition by the Douglas Historical Foundation. It carries the signature of Donald Wills Douglas, who, we mustn't forget, was the driving force behind this remarkable line. It seems that DWD encouraged tremendous loyalty, and 50 years later, his colleagues are giving up their time to work on his creation. My 14-year-old uh, son has flown virtually all over the world in DC-10s and Boeing 747s, and I had to bring Scott in here to show him what a commercial transport looked like that was outfitted with propellers and not jet engines, because he, like so many other youngsters today, have grown up in the world of space shuttle and space stations, and they don't realize that this we had to have these aircraft uh, in order to get where we are today. And, we have to have today's jets for the future hypersonic aircraft of tomorrow. And this airplane, the DC-2, that first flew on May 11, 1934, uh, was a quantum leap over the aircraft that had flown just 10 years before it in 1924. I'll say it was, look at this, Croydon, London Airport in 1935. That's the year the Dakota first flew. Hard to believe that the rich and the famous, flying was still a bit elitist then, were content to travel in these Handley Page Heracles, the 1930s onset of the jumbo jet, but then they didn't know any better, even though the Americans were way ahead on the other side of the Atlantic. Flying from Britain in 1935 was still an adventure. You set off for somewhere in the Empire, and you got there three weeks later. In contrast, at the same time, America's TWA, the Lindbergh line they called it, was pioneering the Douglas commercial, much more advanced in every way, and the first aeroplane of the people. It would bring down fares purely by carrying more passengers more quickly. In 1936, American Airlines used the DC-3 as a sleeper transport. It became temporarily fashionable to fly at night. Coast-to-coast -coast journeys were more comfortable and less boring. And whilst not every flight was filled with pretty girls in silk dressing gowns, American Airlines were laughing all the way to the bank. Before the DC-3, they lost money. After it, they made it hand over fist. And that was the key. Because it was so economical, it was difficult to replace. After the war, the new British European Airways flew scores of them. Not all the pilots were Clark Gable lookalikes, but in the austerity of post-war Britain, it was just the aircraft the airline needed. A Dakota flew BEA's first ever scheduled service from Northolt in 1946 and did sterling work through the 50s, shuttling around Europe. Of course, it took six hours to Vienna and 11 to Athens, and because the DAC was unpressurized, boiled sweets came in handy. BEA quickly developed a habit of restyling their aircraft. The Dakotas became pioneers and were individually christened. In the early years, the pilots wore their old RAF uniforms because they had no others. Stewards and later stewardesses served fairly basic meals, though some people who'd never flown before bought packed lunches. For hundreds of hostesses, the Dakota was their entry into this not-so-glamorous world. Well, I think the first thing I thought about really was the size of them. They were very small, and once we were inside, it was the steep incline up to the cockpit that uh, really rather staggered everybody, including the passengers. 
Um, we used to walk up to check that the passengers were in. It was a big struggle, rather like mountaineering. And then coming back, it was almost a slide down to the tail again. And then having checked everybody was in, we then mountaineer back to tell the captain they were all strapped in. One captain, I believe he was based up in Scotland. I never actually met him myself. But he would come on to the aircraft on one occasion with a white stick and he would carefully tap his way all the way up to the front. And then he would sit down and after a while he said, is nobody going to fly this thing? And he said, never mind, I'll do it. So complete with his white stick and glasses, he went into the cockpit. All the passengers were sitting there biting their fingers. And of course they took off. In 1952, BEA took two Dakotas and fitted them with Rolls-Royce Dart engines later to be used in the Viscount. They were to be flying test beds. The pilots wore pressurized suits and flew at extraordinary heights. The Americans in particular, of course, who'd been brought up on the Dakota. And we used to fly across the top of Frankfurt, and um, they'd come up and say, type of aeroplane, because it was most unusual in 52 to have aeroplanes of any sort flying up there, apart from jet fighters. And we always came back and said, DC-3. And there was always a stunned silence from Ryan men. In Vincey, one day, they scrambled three fighters, came up alongside us, Dakota, which was sitting up there at 41,000 feet. And the guy leading the three pressed his button and said to Frankfurt Control, hell, it is a DC-3, and I don't believe it. And they peeled away and off they went. And of course, afterwards, every day we passed over there, we used to get some crack from these Americans about this DC-3. But a superb airplane, even at that height, it used to handle properly and we had no problems with it. The Dart Dakota is long gone. A more familiar sight today is this, the old lady abandoned in the long grass at the edge of airfields the world over. With scenes like this, can it be true, as some still say, that the Dakota will go on forever? Here in Southern California, they will tell you that the answer to that question is certainly yes. At Burbank Airport in Hollywood, where Bob Hope keeps his private plane, the US aircraft company are buying up DAX like there's no tomorrow. In their hangar, they rather ungraciously chop up the fuselage, insert a new section to make room for four more seats, but most significantly, remove the old Pratt & Whitney Wasp engines and replace them with a modern engine called the PT-6, because the DAX airframe will go on and on, even if the engines won't. All this produces a strange-looking aeroplane called the Turbo-3. We're targeting in the immediate future for a production rate of one aircraft per month uh, we feel we'll increase this to two aircraft per month within a few years. Is there a bit of a romantic thing here as well about keeping the Dakota going? Oh, indeed. Indeed there is. Uh, amongst our staff and amongst our customers. It's not only in the United States that they've considered revamping the DAC. Back at Stansted, where we began, Air Atlantic are thinking along the same lines. It's getting harder and harder to find spare engines and more and more difficult to overhaul the old ones, which in the long term threatens Air Atlantic's Dakota joyrides and the enjoyment they give to thousands of DAC fans every year. You get the old, old, sorry, take that back, the wartime um, enthusiastic pilots coming along and it's wonderful to feel the enthusiasm as they tell you that they were at Arnhem or over the Rhine or they were uh, in the parachute um, brigade regiments uh, and indeed lots of enthusiasm. Then of course you have the, the uh, man of about 40 who will come along and tell you that um, his father flew the DC-3 no doubt during the war and lastly but not least of course you have a youngster of eight or ten who will come along and upset you greatly by saying my grandfather used to fly these you see and um, so anyway that's it indeed the passengers are terrific what will all those passengers those enthusiasts who hold the DAC in such affection do when her time is really up flying like those early days of designing aeroplanes will never be quite the same again we were young I don't suppose there were more than 20 of us, and we were in one room attached to the engineering department, and um, we were in close contact with the shop. We knew everybody in the shop, everybody knew us. We spent half our time in the shop, and uh, we went home at night just filled with exhilaration. 
Well, you know, as things get bigger and more complicated and uh, you've got to fill out papers and you have to get approvals and all that sort of thing, it isn't quite so much fun. But we really enjoyed it. And we enjoyed working for Doug. Why do you think it has survived for 50 years? Well, just because it was the best. <laughs> it was the best. 